Yes. I love that song too. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. I say thank you for everyone who's uh, done a part this morning. A lot, of, a lot of things happening around here. A lot of work being done. Turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. I'm going to be looking at verses 10 through 13 <clears throat> this morning. I was just sitting there thinking, making it to the end of the book of Philippians. It's been a while. I don't know how long it's been since we've been in it, taking a paragraph or so at a time. And I've noticed smaller sections we've been taking because just precious little gems that we find. And even here towards the end, we get to a, I get to four verses and I'm like, I have to treat this alone. And while I was working on it, I thought I might have to split it into two, but I didn't. But, but I, I'm sitting there thinking, precious gems, and then I thought, that's funny. Uh, who was it? Uh, Burroughs, Jeremiah Burroughs, the Puritan, wrote uh, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment and has a lot to do with these verses that we're looking at here. So a precious passage and a passage that if we can learn what Paul learned, if we can know what Paul knows, uh, we will be adequate for anything. So... Beautiful passage. Read it with me. Um, do have a Bible in front of you. Please find one. If you don't have one, there should be one somewhere around you. Really want you looking, looking at it as we're going through it. So Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Father, as we approach this text, I pray for each one of us. As we look at what we have before us, is what we need. A relationship, a vital relationship with you. Christ's power dwelling in us. We will be ready for anything. We pray this for those that we love, for those that we care about, that Regardless of what comes at them, rejection by friends, rejection by the masses, whether it be cancer, whatever it be, Father, we look at this jewel here and we realize that this is what we should be praying for those we love, that they will have within themselves because of a relationship with you and because of your strength and power flowing through them. With that alone, they have everything they need. And they can be content. Submitted to, satisfied with, delighted in any circumstance. Father, I pray that uh, we'll learn this. That uh, today, if we haven't already been practicing this, we will put it into practice. And we'll examine ourselves every time we think we need something more, think we need our circumstances changed, I pray, Father, that you'll bring this passage to mind and help us to remember that Paul learned it. And it's something we need to learn. We learn it by trusting in you. Please guide us, Father. Open our eyes as we look at this passage. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I received a call this week. I looked down at my phone and it said, Dr. Jacob Smith doctor calling the house. I took the call and it was the doctor's nurse. And in the conversation with her, I said something about Dr. Jacob Smith. And she said, oh no, you mean nurse practitioner Jacob Smith. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got it in my phone as doctor because that's how I know to look up, you know, look him up. But you could tell it kind of offended her or she wanted to make sure I was straight. He's not a doctor. And then a couple days later, I get a phone call from 
nurse practitioner Jacob Smith. And I thought, and he introduced himself that way. And I thought, man, that's a mouthful. Nurse practitioner. Both of those times when practitioner was brought up, it brought to mind the passage that we looked at last week. Look at it there with me. Verse 9. Look at what Paul says. He says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So as I said last week, every Christian is called to be a practitioner of sorts. We are to put these things into practice. The definition of a practitioner is a person actively engaged in the art, the discipline of the profession, especially medicine, right? A person who practices a profession. So Paul has here, if you look at it there in verse 9, he has commanded, and in reality the Holy Spirit, God himself, has commanded that you as a Christian are to go into practice practice these things. And look at it. This is, this is what I, I find very interesting in the tie-in with the passage we're looking at this morning. What Paul says here is, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And I believe immediately he goes into pointing out something he was known for. Something they had learned and received and heard about regarding Paul. Something they had seen in Paul. It's like Paul is saying, okay, here's your homework. <laughs> I've just told you that all these things you've heard and seen and, and, and learned from me, put them into practice, and he's saying, here's your homework. And he goes on in this passage to say thank you for their gift, but notice what he does here in 10 through 13. He wraps that whole little thank you note in a lesson on contentment, doesn't he? In fact, look at it. He, he expresses appreciation, but then he goes on to spend much more time teaching and reminding them of this treasure of contentment. Okay? Paul's life was the perfect example that we have in Scripture of a human being besides Christ. He is the perfect example. But we have in Paul a, a, a wonderful example of contentment. He was known for his contentment. And it stood out. It had to stand out. As he said back here, a chapter or two back, like a shining light in a dark, in a dark place, right? Because when someone has contentment, when they're really content, able to say, God, wherever you have me, I am delighted and I am satisfied. And we all look at that and think, how? But Paul says it, doesn't he? When you have someone that can do that, that stands out. That, that's a light shining in the darkness. You think about Paul. As far as we know, and you can come to me later and tell me, he had very few earthly things, right? He had some tools so he could make tents so that he could pay his own way. He had some scrolls. He had a cloak. <laughs> we know from, from other readings. And we don't know of anything else that he owned. He was light, wasn't he? He traveled around. He got a little help now and then. He did a little work now and then to provide for his needs. But he had everything he needed. And he's already said this back in chapter 3 because he had Christ. And Christ was what he was going after. Perfectly content with very little in earthly things. If you look at this verse, uh, 10 through 13, you'll see that the majority of it is a focus on being content in Christ. Look at it there in verse 11 and 12. He says basically the same thing three times. One, one commentator said, he says it this way, then he says it backwards this way. I had a hard time seeing that. But he says the same thing. Look at it there in verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He said it once. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. He said it twice. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Three times. The same statement, wrapped around a little thank you for the gift that you sent me. And look at this. Paul has learned something here. He says learned twice. Two different Greek words for the word learned. I've learned this, he says. And he says, I know this. Four times he uses those words. This is something that has to be learned. This is not something we're born with. And he's learned something that is extremely valuable. Something that we all need to, to know. Something that, as I said in my prayer, will be there to give us everything we need in whatever horrible circumstance we find ourselves in. We're 
complete in Him when He's in us. We need to know what the source, the true source of contentment is. And by the way, that's verse 13. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Contentment is not having a million dollars in the bank. We think, if I just had a million, and then once we have a million, if I just had two million, <laughs> if I just had a little bit more, Contentment is not having all the nice toys and all the nice houses. It's not being liked and admired by thousands of people. Melissa said you need to add there, contentment is not having a perfect relationship. <laughs> contentment is being delivered from the dependence on those things. And deliverance from whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. A, de a deliverance from a dependence on circumstances. Contentment is found in, as we see there in verse 13, complete dependence upon Christ. That's when you have all you need. In a personal relationship with Him, we can be content with or without and in any circumstance. And that brings peace that he left off with last week at the end of verse 9. You have all you need within your relationship with Christ. Nothing outside can reach you where it really counts. And I like the way that Paul has done this. Twice now he said, and, and four times total, he's said that this is something we have to learn. It's a learned art. It's come to him over time. Paul didn't start out immediately content with everything. He progressed as he learned. We all need to become practitioners. We all need to start putting things into practice. And we've got our homework cut out for us, don't we? Because on a daily basis, we're not content with so many things. And you know how we, how we practice this. The next time you find yourself saying, I need, I need, I need, you know, I, I need this to change. I need this in my life. We need to stop and we need to look at ourselves and ask some questions. Is this really what I need? Do I believe in the, the providence of God? Do I believe that God is aware of and knows what I need and is bringing into my life Right when I need it, what I need. And sometimes it's, it's not good things. It's not always a gift. It's not always a wonderful thing. Sometimes it's a very difficult thing to shape us and to change us. What is it? We need to ask ourselves. What is it that really is going to bring true fulfillment in my life? Is it this gadget? Is it this new house? This circumstance? Or is grace sufficient? Is Christ sufficient? Can He truly do what He says and provide peace? We are called to self-examination, aren't we? To look at ourselves and examine ourselves. I'm going to use, I'm going to use three words as an outline <clears throat> for these four verses. Appreciation, contentment, and confidence. I tried to find another C there, but I couldn't. So, appreciation, contentment, and confidence. So first look at appreciation. Using just one word kind of allows me to go in a couple different directions. Paul, in this passage, verse 10, simply expresses appreciation, doesn't he, for the gift that they've given him. But he knows also what's behind that gift, that God's providence, God seeing what he needed and preparing and giving it to him through his obedient followers, it really came from God. And Paul understood that. Remember James said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And it comes through His people very often. Look at verse 10 with me, His, his appreciation. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So he, he does. He just simply expresses thanks, doesn't he? Some of your translations, real quick, uh, start there at verse 10 with the word but. But I rejoiced in the Lord. It, it's in the NASB. It's in the uh, Greek interlinear. It's in the legacy. It's in the King James Version. So the better translations start this with the word but. So, so why, why would he start with the word but? If you go back and, and look at the end of verse 9, and if you go back and also look at verse 7, 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, verse 7 says, and the God of peace will be with you. Chapter 4 is known as the, the peace chapter in the New Testament, or, or where the Bible speaks about peace. He's, he's speaking there about the wonderful peace that the Lord has given us, the wonderful peace that, that God provides, that He gives us everything we need when we need it. And, and Paul starts this section off by saying, but I don't want to overlook your gift. Your gift was very thoughtful. Your gift was, was needed, and it came at the perfect time. So yes, God provides all of our needs, our greatest needs, but, but thank you for your thoughtful gift. The Philippian church, I thought this was interesting. James Boyce brought this up. He said the Philippian church will be, will be remembered for what? He said the, the Corinthian church will be remembered for their problems. The Laodicean church will be remembered for its apostasy. The Thessalonians will be remembered for their doctrinal disputes over the second coming. And he said the Philippian church is remembered for remembering Paul. <laughs> remembering him. And look, look at how he how they remembered him. When Paul left Philippi, the first time he went to Thessalonica, and he was there, he, uh, they sent messengers from, from Philippi, from Macedonia, to, to see how he was doing, and they found out he needed financial help. And so what they do, they took up a collection and they fired it off. Later, they heard of more needs, and they did it again. If you look there, Philippians 4.16 it says it, Even in Thessalonica you sent help for my needs once and again. So Paul went from there to Berea, then to Athens, and his companions went back to Macedonia, uh, or back to Philippi. But, both, but then Paul went off to Corinth. So you can imagine the Philippians kind of losing track of him and saying, where's he at now? How's he doing? Does he need anything? How can we, how can we know how we can help him? I mean, they didn't know where he had gone, if he had left Greece completely. An answer finally came that Paul was in need again. And what did the Philippians do again? Once more, took up a collection and sent it off to him and took care of him. 2 Corinthians 11.9, there's two other times too, uh, where it says, the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. Think about this now. This is Paul. This is Paul who most often rejected financial help, didn't he? I don't want, I don't want, to, be, I don't want it to be construed as I'm, as I'm hoarding money and making money off this and I'm doing it for the money. Most often he said, no, I, I don't need your money. But there were times when he needed it. And there were times when these guys were constantly dogging him so that they could help him, so that they could give him what he needed. Now look at this. Many years have passed since Paul first came into Philippi and news reaches them that he's in Rome, that he's in prison, that he is completely in need. He's been left by most everyone. He's alone. He's cold. They find out about that. And what did they do? They, they get Epaphroditus. They get a collection together and they send it off. And Paul, verse 10, rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. It's one of the main reasons for the letter, is to say thank you. Look at the word revived there. It's an anathelo or something like that in the, in the Greek. It's a horticultural term, and it means bloomed once again. It's like a, like a flower or a bush that... Uh, was dormant over winter and it almost looked dead through that whole time and then all of a sudden in the spring it blooms again. It, it has to do with sprouting again. You cut off a, a, a tree in the, in the field and you think you got it, you think it's dead and the next thing you know there's ten sprouts coming up. Sprout anew. Paul's saying, here come the Philippians again taking care of me. And it almost sounds like when, when you look at it there, doesn't it like, like Paul's saying, well it's about time. You know, at length, you've now revived your concern for me. But evidently, as you look at it there, he evidently knew there was a reason for their delay. And he goes on to say, indeed, you were concerned about me before, but you had no opportunity. Something caused a, a delay. No wonder the Philippians were known as, or used by Paul to say, here's how you give to the Lord's work. You do it from the heart, you do it wholeheartedly, and you pursue it. This is an example for all of us. Turn back to 2 Corinthians with me. And no, this is not going to turn into a message on giving. <laughs> but it is a message on giving, isn't it? A message on giving ourselves to the ministry. 2 Corinthians 8, 
Look at verses 1 through 5. He's here talking about the, the Macedonians. He's talking about the Philippians. Philippi was in Macedonia. 2 Corinthians 8, starting at verse 1. And we need to look at this because this ties into where we're going. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and, I, and as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They had something really precious going on there in Macedonia and Philippi. God was working in their hearts. They gave above and beyond their means. And I do not believe, I firmly do not believe that this means they made a faith pledge and then took out credit cards in order to meet the goal. <laughs> that's horrible. And that's wrong. That's not, that's not what they did. They gave to such an extent that it affected their standard of living that they went without. They gave because God had set it on their heart and then they obeyed. There are too many preachers, too many missionaries, too many uh, churches have used this example to manipulate people into giving. But uh, this is what I want us to notice here. God is the one who initiated this desire to give, this, this love uh, for the saints. Look at it there in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. I've, I've always had written right up here, grace did a heart work. God's grace did a heart work on these people. God moved them to do this. And they had the blessing of being able to do it. Look at the end of, of verse 5 there. <clears throat> verse 5 says, First they gave themselves to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. So this beginning and end is Paul, Paul, Paul bookends this with God was the one who did it. Yeah, it came through human hands. It came through loving people, kind people, obedient people, people with a heart for the Lord. But God was the one who did it. The providence of God is behind all of this. What he's saying to him is, yes, thank you for the gift. You guys are wonderful. You're always there when I need you. But really, I'm not in need. I have everything I need because Christ is there for me. Christ is providing. He always comes through and He always will. So he's not relying on the Philippians. People will let us down. His trust is in Christ. He is content, truly content in Christ alone because that Verse 13 at the end is, is the capstone on this thing. I can do all things. And that goes up and touches on every single thing he's talking about there. In Christ who strengthens me. Look at verses 11 and 12. He says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So Paul has just expressed gratitude for a gift, a very thoughtful gift that came to him at a time of need. And then he goes on to basically say, but it wasn't necessary. I'm okay. You know, I've thought recently, um, those with a gift of giving have an uphill, uh, an uphill battle. <laughs> because if they are givers and they love to give, most of us don't do the best at receiving, do we? It's like, oh, no, 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 you don't have to do that. But lately, we've been given a lot of nice food and things like that. And it's like, no, you don't. Oh, man, that looks good. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so thoughtful. But you don't, don't feel like you have to do it. And, and that makes it sound like, yeah, keep on giving, you know. You got the, the gift of giving. Exercise your gift, you know, and exercise it my way. That's fine. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes to receive gifts, isn't it? And, and that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, I, I appreciate it, but it, it's really not necessary. What a blessing it is, though. 
It's like, I'm, I'm not grasping for more. So we say that. It's really not necessary. It's very thoughtful. Very thoughtful. But really, I have all I need. Or we could say, well, I'm still practicing, and I could appreciate that. I'm trying to be content, but I'm not, right? Paul's not being ungrateful here. But he does say in honesty, I'm fine with or without. Look what he says there in 11b. He says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. What a statement. Who in the world can say that? I've learned that in whatever situation I am, to be content. First, notice that he says he's learned it. It's a discipline. This is something, as I said before, we, we all need to learn because this does not come natural. <laughs> it's not instinctive, is it? I, I thought of the little kangaroo being born and coming out and, and climbing up the mama's belly and descending into the pouch instinctively. Crazy birds fly across the world and, and they all go to the same place, even though they've been born instinctively. This is not something we do instinctively, is it? We fight and kick and scream. I, I remember being 11, 12 years old, doing driveways on a snow day and made my way around the neighborhood to a 7-Eleven and go in to buy myself lunch. I'm just a young kid, but I see a smaller kid on the floor, on his back, heels hitting the ground, arms flailing, screaming bloody murder in the candy aisle. <laughs> he wanted candy, and I, and I remember thinking, evidently his mom wasn't buying it for him, I remember thinking, what a brat. I thought, and now as an adult, I look back and I think, but we're all that way to a degree. We, we learn how to hide it, don't we? We learn how to control ourselves in a, in a crowd. But I tell you, some people will work their legs off in order to get what they want. They'll leave their family, spend less time with their family, work so hard just so that they can get the toys they want to get. It's sad. I can use myself as an example. As an example there, I remember being young in the grocery cart. My mom gave me, evidently, to, to look at while we were going around the store, a little animal sticker book. And she uh, took it away from me at the end to put it back on the shelf. And I thought, how in the world can you take this away from me? I remember her saying, I must have been really young if I was in the cart. I remember her saying, we'll get it for your birthday. And me thinking, months away. <laughs> I want it now. Very innocent, childish examples. But remember who's saying this. Paul is chained to a guard. He is awaiting a verdict, possibly a death sentence. You think about that. You think about how people respond to situations around them. They go to the workplace and they shoot it up and they kill people because they're unhappy, discontent. Here's Paul, sitting there in chains, and yet he's writing this. I've learned to be content in whatever situation I am. How can he say that? Content, the, the, the word, the Greek word, anatharke, I believe I'm saying that right, means contained. I thought this was interesting. It means contained. It's a description of a person whose resources are within him. So he doesn't have to depend on substitutes outside of himself. It means he is self-sufficient. And you can imagine the Stoics, the Stoic, the Stoic philosophers at the time loving this idea. Nothing can touch me. Bad situations can't touch me. They don't, they don't make any difference at all. Just got this Stoic look on my face, right? Good situations, win the lottery, doesn't touch me. I'm, I'm contained within myself. But Paul's not, Paul's not talking about stoicism here. He's talking about, as a Christian, he is not sufficient in himself. He is sufficient, verse 13, in Christ. Christ brings me, gives me everything I need. And we'll experience that in its greatest form, I think I can say that, at death, our greatest enemy. When we get there and we die and we realize in Christ we are now standing before him, alive. He takes care of everything. And, Paul, and what Paul's saying here is, I had to go through several diffi difficult experiences in, in my life in order to learn 
how to be content. He went through them prayerfully. Look back at Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, no, be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Again, He, he redeemed every situation. He took it, and He said, I'm going to use this. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how to trust. Again, He believed that God is sovereign that God is in control, that God loves me, that He providentially brings circumstances into my life for my good and for His glory. They may be extremely difficult, but He loves me. And what does He say in Romans 8? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. He knew that God was in the process of molding him and molding all of His children into the image of His Son, into the image of Christ. And that's never an easy process, is it? It's difficult. He genuinely, genuinely believed, as one author put it, my circumstances are God's appointment for me. Boy, think of everything that Paul experienced. Just real quick, I won't spend a lot of time on it because we've all heard it so many times. He was imprisoned many times. He was flogged. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He experienced hunger. He beaten with rods. He left a day and a night right at sea. I mean, all of these things. He, he had gone through hunger and cold, and yet Paul says, I've learned through all of this that God's always there. He always provides. In fact, he says in another place that God used those weaknesses, insults, distresses, and persecutions to produce godliness in him. And as we saw a couple weeks ago, he wanted for himself what God wanted for himself. How many of us say, no, I don't, I don't want that. I want ease. <laughs> I want abundance. And God says, I have other plans for you. You need other things. The Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs, as I said before, in his book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, defines Christian contentment this way. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. God's wise and fatherly authority in every condition. That's, that's hard to take, isn't it? Not only submitting to God's wise and fatherly authority in every condition, every circumstance, but delighting in it. Because I know you're in control, and I know you provide for me, and I know you love me, and you have me here for your purpose. Amen. Contentment, Christian contentment is a, was a thing in the early church. John the Baptist, some soldiers came up to him and asked, how do I manifest genuine repentance? Remember, John the Baptist was out there preaching for repentance, and, and so many people, probably one of the largest revivals in the world's history, came to him, and soldiers came to him, and they said, how do we manifest this genuine repentance? And what did he say? He said, be content with your wages. Be happy. Be satisfied. Rely on God, not on that. Hebrews 13.5, make sure your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. 1 Timothy 6.8, if we have food and covering, Paul says, with these we shall be content. That's an older pastor talking to a younger pastor saying, remember, if you have food and covering, that's, that's really all you need. <laughs> Don't expect a lot more. As I said, this is not a, <clears throat> not a call to be a stoic. That philosophy had its practitioners and they worked at it really hard to be able to set themselves apart from everything, every circumstance, whatever happened around them, that they wanted not to be touched by it. No, this is a call to learn to cast our whole life on Christ and to trust Him for each and every one of our needs, whether that's because we're really lacking or because now we've had wealth dumped on us and it's going to mess us up. He says, I know how to live either way. In Christ, we have all 
we need. I used the word adequate earlier. There's a uh, commentary, Paul Reese, and I know we have it at home. I looked for it. I couldn't find it. A little red book with a picture of a man on the front of it. It's called The Adequate Man, Paul in Philippians. It's a commentary on Philippians, and it's pulling it from this text right here. He was adequate because he had Christ. And you hear that, you hear that idea in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. That is an adequate person, isn't it? With God's grace empowering you, with Christ in you, strengthening you, you are adequate. You are Christ-sufficient, not self-sufficient. Look at what Paul does here in, in verse 12. And I'm just going to move through this quickly because, like I said, he says the same thing three different ways. Whether it's poverty or prosperity, whether it's filled, you're fat and happy, or famine, or having a lot, or having nothing. He says, in all these things, I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret. Paul had learned how to deal with prosperity. Think about the dangers of prosperity. I would say sometimes, but most times, it's harder to live by faith, in faith, when everything's going your way, when you have an abundance. We tend to forget God, don't we? And Paul says, even when that happens, I'm relying on Christ. So many lives, think about it, how many lives have been destroyed by too much wealth, too much fame. Paul says it again here. It's the second time we see the word learned. He says, I have learned the secret. That could be translated this way. I have become adept at. Isn't that interesting? It's actually the same word used by pagan mystery religions in reference to their inner secrets. So this is really interesting. Paul here is talking to Greeks. He's talking to people who come from pagan religions, and he's already quoted their philosophers, or used a, a phrase that's powerful with the Stoics, and now he's quoting a, 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 using a word as a, as a metaphor, in a sense, from the pagan mystery religions in, in, in reference to their inner secrets that they learn. One author said this, Through trial and testing, Paul was initiated into the wonderful secret of contentment. And this is the part of practicing that we need to remember, that we need to practice. We need to look at Paul. We need to look at Scripture. We need to look at our life. And we need to compare them. We say, I need to change. What do I need to change here? Why am I feeling this way? What was the secret that Paul learned? It was confidence. So there was appreciation, there was contentment, and now there is confidence. The confidence is in Christ. Look at verse 13. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. You know how the Greek uh, shows emphasis in the writing. They take what's emphasized and they put it in the front. They put it at the beginning of a sentence, and it can look really awkward, and it can sound really awkward, and that's what they've done here. In the Greek, this sentence reads, all things I can do in the one empowering me. Not as awkward as some other Greek sentences when they do that, when they show the emphasis. But it starts with, all things I can do. The TEV, I, I like that version, says, I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. The Phillips, I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives in me. Prosperity teachers, as you can imagine, the preachers who preach that God wants you to be wealthy and healthy and happy and all that, you can imagine they love this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can reach great heights in sports. I can reach great heights in business and success. I can be the best real estate agent in the company, right? Because Christ is strengthening me. But when you look at the, the context, this is the problem of pulling out a verse and, and using it. When you look at the context, the two previous verses, it says something very different, doesn't it? It's saying, I can handle any circumstance that comes my way, any difficulty that comes my way, I can be content there in good or terrible situations. Provided God strengthens and empowers me for the task, right? 
That, we got to get that, that. That idea is here. That provided God wants me to do it. He's the one strengthening me. He's not going to strengthen me to do something against His will. He's strengthening me to do His will. It's a secret of, of Paul's contentment. He could live knowing that the strength of God was flowing through him and enabling him to carry out God's will. And that's what he wanted to do. The old Living Bible, the Living Bible, actually did very well with this verse. I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. See, God's grace was sufficient for Paul. Think about that. What circumstance do you have planned for me, Lord? What circumstance am I walking through right now, perhaps? That's what I want, Paul says. <laughs> and I know you're going to provide all that I need. Help me to submit and delight in that. I have all I need in my relationship with you through you strengthening me. Those are confident words, aren't they? Are we able to say that with Paul? If you're like me, you're like, nope, I have a lot of practice. <laughs> I have a lot of practice, practice in front of me. I need to learn what Paul learned. Again, we need to think about God's sovereignty. You find yourself in a situation, and one of the first things you should think about is God's not out of control. This is not out of God's control. And you think of God's providence, how He cares for us on a daily basis by bringing things into our life. I need to be reminded that God's highest goal for me is to be made into the image of His Son. Made holy. And those desires that I have, childish wants, do not line up with His desires for me. Is this the, uh, the guiding principle of my life? That I want to please the Lord. We need to ask ourselves, how can I bring Him the most glory? How can I point the most people towards Him? By living obediently in the circumstances He has me in. Being satisfied, even delighted, <laughs> to be there. Content. Now, I'm just going to mention this, but I should spend more time on it. That doesn't mean we don't have the ability, the freedom, to try to change our circumstances. Paul says that. Yeah, you Work to better your circumstances. But while you're there, be content with the strength that He gives you. This last week I picked up Helen Rosevere's book, um, Enough is the title, a little bitty book, with the subtitle, verses 11 and 13, through 13 of our text here. She was a, uh, she was a missionary. She was a little lady from Ireland who was schooled in Cambridge prior to 59 as a doctor, who went to the Congo to become a doctor out in the middle of nowhere in a rainforest. 1953 to 1973, she was there. It's amazing to see how God used her. She worked in terribly difficult circumstances, doing surgery, open bodies, and more than once, often, the lights would go off. <laughs> she had 48 clinics that she would go to with other doctors and stay up with. 18-hour days, a line of people out the door from before sunup to after sundown, working her tail off. I found in here as I was reading, also preparing two Bible lessons um, a week, or teachings a week, and, and, a, and a lesson every day. They worked her. I don't think you could get people to work like that today, could you? But think about that, the, the difficulties that she went through, everything she, she experienced out there. Her point in this book is that God was constantly teaching her, and she's constantly bringing forward this situation, this situation, and another one, difficult circumstances where God was teaching her, my strength is sufficient. In me you have all you need. During her stay there, a, a communist uprising or rebellion came about, she was actually captured along with several other doctors and, and nurses. She was brutalized and raped by one of the rebels and went through a horrible situation. But let me, let me just read to you a little bit here what she says about after that. 
She says, four years later, on my second furlough, having been rescued from guerrilla soldiers and from five months of captivity in what came to be known as the Simba Uprising, I took many meetings up and down the UK to testify to the all-sufficiency of the grace of God. Even in the midst of unimaginable cruelty and suffering and danger, His grace was sufficient for each of us. His promise in Isaiah 26.3 to keep us in perfect peace as our minds were stayed on Him was amazingly true. She said, I used to say, when your back's to the wall, He is sufficient for you. You need nothing else. Just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And then listen to this. Seven years later, having gone back with many others and having worked hard to recreate all that had been destroyed, she was having horrible nightmares um, at night, just remembering everything. She says, to start the college again and to upgrade the standards every year, there was suddenly an uprising of the students against authority, apparently saying that we, in particular me, had embezzled college funds. She said, I was devastated. There, there were no college funds, just generous gifts from supporters back in the UK, and everything that came month by month was plowed into the work. She says, there, there followed a very painful trial. The leaders of the medical center sat as judge. The students were allowed to present their case. I was in the dock as the accused. It was hard to believe that it was all actually taking place. After having given all one had for 20 years, it had come to such a climax. Eventually, I left and went up to my home in tears. What should I do next? She says, God seemed to ask me a question. When you were at home after the rebellion, you told everyone that I, God, was sufficient for all your needs. Is that not still true? Yes, God, of course, you are sufficient for all my needs. No, God seemed to reply, you want Jesus plus, plus a sense of success, going home with photographs of your students and the football team you had coached, with tape recordings of the choir you had trained, singing parts of Handel's Messiah. You want the leadership to write to urge you to return again because they can't really cope with the college without you. She says, my heart ached. A battle was raging inside of me. Yes, I did want to be missed. Yes, I did need others to think of me as a success, yet at the same time my heart knew that Jesus was all I actually wanted or needed. At last, brokenhearted, I confessed to God my pride and told Him, yes, I only want Jesus, not Jesus plus. She says, the dear Lord restored peace to my heart, as once again He made so clear to me that Jesus is enough for every situation. His grace is sufficient to meet every need. <clears throat> You hear Paul, who went through everything he said, saying, Christ is enough. You hear so many people make the same statement. I'll be content if everyone likes me. <laughs> then Christ is not enough. I'll be content if they just realize they can't survive without me. And Christ isn't enough. Now, you and I have situation after situation in our lives to help us learn, Right? She'd, she'd go through these things and she'd, she'd study every one of them. She'd think, How, what was he saying to me here? We have so many opportunities to learn what Paul learned, to know what he knew. Daily, we can put these things into practice. All things I can do through him who strengthens me. Christ is everything we need, isn't he? And we need to live that way. I have learned to be content in every circumstance. Not self-sufficient, but Christ-sufficient. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your daily care, allowing even difficult things into our life. That's most often what brings us back to you. I pray, Father, that you help each one of us to understand the wealth that we have in Christ, not only eternal, an eternal inheritance, not only heaven in your presence, but also the ability to live here and now in a very dark and difficult place, but to live there in a victorious way. I pray that you help each one of us see what you've promised here, what you've provided for us. And I pray, Father, that you help us 
to go to work, trusting in you, realizing that it's your strength that's working in us, realizing that, as Paul said earlier, it's, it's even your strength bending our will. <laughs> Help us to realize all you've done for us, Father, all you want to do for us, and help us to yield to that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.